Hi, I'm Stephen Paul, and welcome to the Land of Israel, God's Story. This is going to be an extraordinary adventure we go on with Academy Award winner John Voight, who's going to tell the greatest stories of the Bible. Swings around, like that. And, then he, and then he lets it go. We're going to go off-road with a great tour guide, Aaron Schaefer. That entire compound is called the Temple Mount. Under that massive platform is the peak of Mount Moriah. And two extraordinary rabbis, Chaim and Levi Chunin. The awareness how one man set out to change the entire world from right here. This is going to be an extraordinary adventure. We're in the land of miracles. Israel, welcome to it. And let's go. Welcome to the land of Israel, God's story. I'm Stephen Paul, my dear friend John Voigt, Aaron Schaefer, and Levi and Chaim Kuhn. And we are on the site of Abraham. And John's going to tell us one of his stories, one of those lovely stories that he's been telling me for 20 years. <laughs> we're, we're in ancient Beersheba right now. And uh, Be Beersheba was the first place that Abraham came to establish himself to set down roots in a long journey. And so he built a well here. He, built a he planted trees. He established this place which is right on a trade route, went by his place continuously so he could do God's work here. This is an extraordinary place. Now this, this well here was probably not Abraham's well, probably it was Isaac's well, but uh, Abraham set a well here first. Every time we come to these places, we're awed that there's so much, you know, so much that uh, still exists and tells the rich story of the Bible. So we feel like we're walking in, in, the, in the land of the Bible. Behind, uh, behind the cameras here, there, there's Bedouin vis villages to this day. And, uh, and so we're really feeling we're alive in Abraham's time. Now, when Abraham came here, there was no city. All that there was was a, was a desert, essentially. There was desert, no trees, no water or anything. Um, Abraham came here uh, to sort of get away from all the powers that be so he could be independent and establish his religion, his belief in the one God and spread it throughout the world. And to do so, he did a few things here at ancient Beersheba. In the middle of nowhere, he dug a well and he found water. And in the desert where we are, water is the source of life. If you don't have water, you can't live. Um, and there's not water to be found unless you find the right place in the, in the groundwater. He planted a tree, what's called an eshel or a terebinth in English. Um, and John and I saw uh, an eshel tree as we were walking up here. They grow here everywhere, beautiful trees. How did it taste? It not? tasted salty, very salty. And, uh, and this is because this tree actually clears the water in a sense. It cleans the salt out of the groundwater and it's part of the technique how you can uh, live in the desert and Abraham um, I don't know if he had prophecy or he learned the wisdom from the locals but 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 that's what he did and ultimately he established a center here and as John was mentioning this is an international trade route there's two routes that cross over here one going north to south like this that goes from Mesopotamia to Egypt where all the political traffic was going all the diplomats all the you know important people and one going from east to west across the route which was essentially all the merchants bringing pearls jewels precious spices and precious uh, goods from Arabia and the Persian Gulf across the desert on camel trains to the port in Gaza on the west which is behind us so Abraham set up here which on the one hand it's in the middle of nowhere but on the other hand it's really in the center of everything. So he has, on the one hand, independence from the local powers that be, but on the other hand, he has access to the most important and most wealthy people in the world to spread his ideas and for them to take it along with them wherever they go. The information superhighway. Yeah. Before there was an internet. Should we go take a little look at the uh, well here? Can we just walk yeah. up and take a look at all Let's of us? Let's take a look. I want to tell you about this well a little bit. It's unbelievable, really. Let me get a stone here. I want to show you something. 
So, guys, take a look how deep this well is. There's no water in it anymore. Wow. But this is about, uh, it's over 200 feet deep like a 20 story building, right? This is not the well that Abraham dug, probably. No one knows for sure, but it's beyond the, the scope of this discussion because it's, it's a lot of pieces of evidence that we would have to bring in to understand exactly where is the well that Abraham dug. The cliff notes are that this is probably the well that Isaac dug. I wanna show you something. I'm gonna drop this stone, okay? And it might hit the metal immediately, so that's not the noise you're listening for. You're gonna wait about four or five seconds, you're gonna hear it hit the bottom, okay? And that's how tall this well is. So ignore if it hits the metal and then wait for the next sound. You guys see? Wow. You said wow before it hit. <laughs> and with that said, we'll be right back. Wow. <laughs> uh, hit the crate. <laughs> and welcome back to the land of Israel, God's story. We're on Abraham's site. One of the most important stories, perhaps the most important stories of Abraham's life begins right here. That story is after Abraham has many miracles in demonstrating his faith and his trust in God. The biggest miracle of having Isaac with Sarah when she was 90 and he was 99. And then that son that God told Abraham, he will build a great nation. Now God's telling him, take your son Isaac to the Mount Moriah, which is in Jerusalem, and offer him up as a sacrifice. And Abraham gets up early in the morning, right here from Be'er Sheva, completely irrational. The same God that promised Abraham and Sarah that their child Isaac would be the father to this great nation is now instructing him to offer him up as a sacrifice. And Abraham says, Hineni, I'm here. He doesn't ask any questions. He says, I'm here. And we actually read this every day before we pray. And that's because it demonstrates the highest level of faith possible. Because belief often could be limited to the way the mind works. Of course, if someone's experiencing miracles, then it's going to strengthen their trust and belief from where that's coming from. But then being asked to do something that's completely irrational and nevertheless not asking questions because of where it's coming from and submitting to that. At the end, of course, the angel comes out and says, no, 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 that's not what God wants. He doesn't want you to do that. Didn't want, he, wants, he wanted to give you this opportunity to demonstrate your faith. And at that moment, the whole idea of serving a higher power changes because at that time, as Aaron could tell us, there was human sacrifice taking place to all these other gods. And that story changed that's that whole perspective, that whole way of being present and being and surrendering to God, you know? So at the end of it, at the end of that story is, and then we read every day, and then it says, and Abraham came back to Be'er Sheva. Right, right. With his family, you know? So it started here and it finished here. Wow. How old was Isaac? 37 years old. Aaron said something very important. He said, when they came back, they were not the same. Mm. because of this experience. How were they not the same? When you read the story in the Bible, you might think that Isaac was like an unwilling participant. If you're not sensitive to what's going on and you don't have the traditions that were passed down, you could read it to think that Isaac is like some small boy. That's a man. See, it's a man. Uh, uh, you know, accepting like his father. That's not a father taking a son as a sacrifice. What you're saying is what the rabbis uh, comment based on the fact that you see in the narrative that um, several times Isaac starts asking Abraham, he says, Father, um, you said we're doing a sacrifice, but where's the, the animal? Where's, you know, what's going on? He, Isaac is asking questions and Avram is saying, don't worry, God will take care of it. And Isaac starts to read between the lines what's going on. 
And I think by the time they got there, and this is what the rabbis say, he knew exactly what was intended and he surrendered to it. And Abraham was willing to give up his son and Isaac was willing to give up his life. Yeah. To me, experiencing this moment in time and this space where we are gives us the awareness how one man set out to change the entire world from right here. And today, thousands of years later, more than half of the population of the world today is in somehow, some way following Abraham's tradition of his belief in the one God and you know what that belief calls upon us to do. And we are the Abrahams of today. Abraham was just one man who completely changed and transformed the entire world. And every single one of us has that same potential and opportunity and responsibility to not see ourselves just as one of a billion people, but each of us have that power from Abraham to take upon ourselves that mission to connect heaven and earth with the one God and all that that calls upon us to do. Every day in our prayers, we invoke Abraham we invoke Isaac, we invoke Jacob. And whenever there is a moment that requires a special intervention or a special blessing for healing or for the needs that we have, the first thing we do is we invoke Abraham. We remind God that Abraham was his chosen servant and we are his children. And therefore we ask God to deal kindly with us because we are the children of Abraham and because we are the descendants of Isaac and Jacob. But here we have that special power because we are in the very space that Abraham began his journey. So it's something that hopefully we can take with us and use it to change the world. And with that said, we'll be right back. And welcome back to the land of Israel, God's story. We're on Abraham's site. Is there a prayer that would go with this particular land and with what you're talking about? The prayer that we recite three times a day, the Shemona Esrei, the 18, the prayer of 18 blessings. It starts with, Baruch Hashem, blessed are you, Lord our God, Elokeinu Malach HaOlam, Master of the Universe. Elokeinu Elokeinu Avaseinu. Elokeinu Elokeinu Avaseinu. Our God and the God of our fathers. Elokei Avraham, the God of Abraham. Elokei Yitzchak, the God of Isaac. Elokei Yaakov, the God of Jacob. And that prayer continues with asking God to bless us with good health and with sustenance. And the prayer ends with, Baruch Atah Hashem, Blessed are you God, Magain Avraham, He who shelters Abraham. And this incredible invocation of our connection to Abraham and asking God to bless us in that light is something that is on our lips every single day. This is one of many instances throughout the day that we remind ourselves and God of our connection to Abraham. The image that every one of us are created in, the image of Elohim, is a power that exists within us that is meant to be unleashed. And through our choices, we get to do that. And Abraham demonstrated that through his hospitality. Because hospitality requires someone to go outside of their own, their own comfort zone and to do something for others with no conditions to it. Whether it be with the Jewish people, whether it be with the Bedouins, it is that tradition of Abraham that's been embraced and continues to be embraced and it is the ways of Abraham to bring out the image of Elohim that we continue to strive for. That all began right here, at the center, the first. So we just entered into the, the gate of uh, ancient Beersheba, and uh, there's actually, there's two stages of the gate. That's an earlier stage. This is, this is an earlier stage, that's a latter stage. And what's really amazing about these uh, gates that we're walking through is that all the gates of the ancient cities and Israel, 
they have these chambers. Come take a look. You see how in the chamber of the gate, there's a bench all around. In biblical times, the Torah commands, Shoftim v'shotrim titen lecha b'chol sharecha. You shall place judges and police in all of your gates. And that's the way that the Torah established justice, is that every region had a city that rules it. And when the farmers and the villagers and the people would have any kind of dispute among themselves, they would ascend to the city, which was always on a high area. And they would come to the gates of the city and they would consult with the judges and the officers. And in that way, they kept peace and justice in the land. And here is the bench. It's original. It's still here where the judges would sit. Would that the expression, tell it to the judge? Tell it to the judge. Abraham established his presence. Isaac expanded it more. And then later in the time of Joshua, they conquered this area and the kings of Israel always established some sort of a city here to rule over the area all around. And that's what we see in front of us today. What's left from the site is the city that the kings of Judah built 2,800 years ago, a little bit after Solomon. So now I want to take you guys up because I want you to see something really amazing. <laughs> Where, where are we headed? We're headed up to the top of the observation tower that they built for us here. Isn't it, a, isn't it amazing? Unbelievable. It's amazing. Do you understand why I dragged you up here, John? I got it. <laughs> I, I dragged you up all these uh, steps because you have to see this. I mean, 3,800 years ago, we just told how Abraham came here with just his family. He dug a well, he planted a tree, he had an idea that he wanted to carry out in the world, an idea of belief in God, of morality, uh, of hospitality, of all these values that survive till today. And in this very place, we can see just behind us, we, we saw the modern city of Beersheba. Can you see it, John? All the skyscrapers, the Ben-Gurion University, the Soroka Hospital, the high-tech parks, the house of Aaron Schaefer. That's true. I also, I'm very honored to live in Beersheba. And you know, every day when I step out of my house, I go to my office, or I walk to the synagogue on Shabbat, I think to myself, it's totally possible that Abraham walked exactly here. It's, it's totally possible. And if not here, he walked a few meters away from here. It's unbelievable. Yeah. And, and what do we have over here now? So we have... Uh, Let's go around to the other side. Hey, because this is a Bedouin. Uh, town. Go ahead. So, if you look out over here, we have on the right in the valley, we have some really original, authentic Bedouin camp encampment. And then here we have a sort of village of the Bedouin that are sort of transitioning into a more modern lifestyle called Tel Sheva. And th these Bedouins now are, are members of of Israel. The Bedouins who live in this part of the country are citizens of the modern state of Israel. They have all the rights and obligations of any other citizen. Many of them serve in the Israeli Defense uh, Forces, many of them with uh, distinguishment. Um, and of course, it's a transition for them after thousands of years of living culturally, basically, and the way that Abraham did almost 4,000 years ago. Now they're part of a modern society. And so this town of Tel Sheva is sort of transitioning into a modern society. It's more like a village than a city like Beersheba, the Jewish city. And it's called, and they have always called it Tel Sheva, the ruin of Sheva, like Beersheba. Abraham's mission to bring forth certain examples of certain behavior that he that he established in his life and he created from that. This is all, all of this that we see, modern, modern Israel, all of this is, is affected by his behavior and what he taught. This is the land of Israel, God's story.